Okay, hello everyone and good evening. Uh, we're going to start our program now. Um, I just want to thank everyone, all everyone for coming out, including the panelists and our guests in the audience as we celebrate Black History Month and celebrate, and more importantly, Dr. James Braxton and learning about his cont contributions as a Black engineer. Um, and first, I would like to introduce everyone that's going to be on our panel. First, we have Leah Laskatov, the Head of Archives and Special Collections at the Samuel C. Williams Library, aka the Stevens Library. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Swindle, Teaching Assistant Professor in the College of Arts and Letters. Uh, Mrs. James, uh, Mrs. Virginia Braxton, sorry, uh, Jane Braxton's widow. Uh, Emery Brown III, James Braxton's grand nephew, and also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, Joelle Hines, who graduated from Stevens in 1993 with a Bachelor's of Engineering in Engineering Management. Now she currently is a certified financial planner, a certified divorce financial analy analy analyst, sorry, uh, and a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley, and was also a participant of the STEP program. And lastly, we have Joshua Hector, um, who is a graduate of the class of 2022, um, and Kobe Dawes, uh, class of 21, who are both founding members of Alpha Phi Alpha and Fraternity Incorporated at Stevens. And so first, um, we're going to do a brief in introduction of the collections and highlights um, given by Leah. So Leah. All right. Thank you, Dewan. Um, welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Leah Laskatoth and I'm the head of Archives and Special Collections at the Samuel C. Williams Library. When I first started at Stevens eight years ago and started working on research for Black History Month post we would dig through the university publications in the archives and consult outside resources such as census records and historical newspaper collections to provide more context. But oftentimes we can only really skim the surface when researching black alumni history. The Stevens archives are working to improve our efforts to acquire more archival materials that document black history and more diverse his historical documentation overall. Um, we want to ensure that future generations not only have access to their history, but that all Stevens alumni can see themselves in Stevens history and feel a personal connection. The James Braxton papers have provided deeper insight into an alumnus that has been honored by Stevens over the years, but whose life details have never been well known. Um, with the recently acquired James Braxton papers, we now know so much more and um, can help to preserve Braxton's legacy, which contributes to the historical narrative. Um, I want to leave plenty of time. Wait, hold on one second. This is not moving forward for some reason. Um, oh, there it goes. Okay. We want to leave plenty of time for discussion and input from our panelists. So I'll just get right into things with a brief overview of who Dr. James Braxton is and some highlights from the James Braxton papers that help illuminate his life story. James Braxton was born in 1914 in um, Waukesha, Wisconsin. Waukesha. Waukesha? Okay, sorry. <laughs> into an, into an integra um, integrated religious community known as the Metropolitan Church Association, um, where his father, Reverend Peter Braxton, was a member. When Braxton was about three years old, his family moved out to the East Coast and they set down roots in Jersey City, New Jersey. He graduated from Lincoln High School in Jersey City with high honors, um, then secured a four-year Edgar B. Bacon scholarship to Stevens and entered in the fall of 1933. Braxton was the second Black student to graduate from Stevens in 1937, second to Randolph Montrose Smith, who was originally from the Barbados and graduated in 1924. While at Stevens, Braxton was involved with the Dramatic Society, the Stoot newspaper, and became a member of the Engineering Honor Society, Tau Beta Pi. According to a newspaper article in the papers, we believe that Braxton was also the first Black member of Tau Beta Pi, an organ organization that did not integrate until the 1930s. He also became a member of the Jersey City chapter of the prestigious Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, historically the first fraternity in North America for Black men, which has included famous members such as Martin Luther King Jr. and W.E.B. Du Bois, um, who Dr. Swindle will talk a little more about in a bit. 
The first Alpha Phi Alpha chapter was officially chartered at Stevens in the beginning of 2019, and Alpha's Joshua Hector, Kobe Dawes, and Brax Braxton's grandnephew, Emery Brown, are joining us um, as panelists here tonight. After Braxton graduated from Stevens, he secured a job as an assistant resident engineer in Atlanta, at Atlanta University to work on installing a power plant. While there, he enjoyed having faculty privileges and would often have dinner in the faculty lounge where he met W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a professor at Atlanta University during that time. He also befriended artist Romare Bearden and took advantage of the vibrant social life that Atlanta had to offer. In 1941, his project ended in Atlanta and Braxton moved on to work with architect Samuel Plato, best known for his beautiful post offices um, nationwide and the first black architect to secure federal contracts in America. Braxton worked on housing projects with Plato, first in Louisville, Kentucky, then went with him to Washington, D.C. Um, during the war years, Braxton was identified as being more valuable back home with his engineering skills, and he worked with Plato to build temporary buildings designed to provide housing, recreation, food, and medical facilities for 900 women in the wartime labor force in Washington, D.C. In 1943, Braxton took a position at Howard University as an instructor in mechanical engineering. And it was during this time um, that he also connected with architect Hilliard Robinson. Robinson was a prominent architect and became well known for creating housing in black communities that thoughtfully addressed the needs of the residents. His most famous housing complex was the Langston Terrace dwellings in the DC area. Braxton would go on to work with Robinson on a project in Liberia in West Africa to help with a construction project celebrating Liberia's centennial celebration. When Braxton returned from Liberia, he went on to pursue his next goal, pursuing a master's degree in city and regional planning at Harvard University. Um, graduating in 1947. But before he completed his Harvard degree, he was awarded a Julius Rosenwald Fellowship in 1946 and went to England to study with the regional town and country planning department out there. The Julius Rosenwald Fellowship was a prestigious award to win in America, and the awardees were often known as the who's who in Black America and included Maya Angelou, W.E.B. Du Bois, and Langston Hughes. In 1950, Braxton moved to Chicago and joined the Chicago Housing Authority at the request of Martin Meyerson, the chief city planner at the time. In 1965, he was promoted to assistant chief engineer of the sanitary district in Chicago and became the first black engineer in Chicago to earn a top level position in that district. Braxton left the government sector in the early 80s and worked for an engineering consulting firm and also pursued his own visionary affordable housing designs, securing a patent for an interlocking masonry design system referred to as Braxton Blocks. The James Braxton papers uh, were just recently acquired into the Stevens archives. Big thanks to Michael Governor in the Office of Development for first facilitating contact with Dr. Braxton's widow, Mrs. Virginia Braxton, who is here tonight as a panelist. Um, it was this initial contact that led to us learning so much more about Dr. Braxton and acquiring the James Braxton papers. Also shout out to Don, Don James in Chicago, who I believe is in our virtual audience um, and helped Mrs. Braxton gather the archival materials and worked on the initial scanning of the images and documents to share with the library. The James Braxton papers contain letters of correspondence, news clippings, business records, ephemera, and photographs which document the personal and professional life of James Braxton. Um, there is much more in this collection than what I, we can cover here in this one event. So I encourage you, if you are interested, to make a research appointment with the library in the near future to view the archival collection at your own pace. 
Some highlights in the collection include Braxton's interest in city planning and designing affordable housing systems. Affordable housing was an important topic during the civil rights movement in America as affordable and quality housing was um, hard to find for black populations who had been historically discriminated against in the housing market and were often forced to live in inefficient housing. Chicago was also one of the most residentially segregated cities in America. Braxton, who lived in Chicago and was a prominent engineer, strived to use his engineering skills to help society with improved affordable housing designs for American cities. Something that would not only increase available quality housing, but help with unemployment rates in those areas as well. His interest in designing affordable housing systems started, started early on in his career. Although the system he devised and secured a patent for came about a bit later in 1986. Even while working in Atlanta, he would photograph housing in black communities and documented housing in general. He seemed to have a cam camera handy in most of his trips. And while in England for the Rosenwald Fellowship, he studied the Garden City movement, which involved planned urban communities that were surrounded by a green belt and also documented English housing while out there. Braxton's interest in affordable housing designs is well documented in his papers and emerges as a central theme throughout his career. Um, in addition, already involved with the civil rights movement, Braxton joined Dr. King in peaceful marches against housing discrimination after D Dr. King moved to Chicago in 1966, a topic that Dr. Swindoll will get more into next, providing um, historical context. All right, so um, Dr. Swindoll. All right. Thanks so much um, to everybody uh, for coming today. Um, and thank you, Leah, for um, that overview. I'll be wanting to make one of those uh, research appointments with the archives soon, by the way. <laughs> um, so I, I'm a um, US historian and my specialty is um, civil rights in the mid, um, well, early to mid 20th century. And so the Braxton papers for me um, are really fascinating um, because there's a, a lot of intersections between, um, you know, ideas around civil rights as well as um, sort of on the ground organic movements and, you know, things we don't always necessarily think about beyond the sort of protest movements that we associate with civil rights. But, you know, literally the issues of where people live and how people live and how to deal with that. Um, and bring equity to that on a daily basis, which seems to be um, a big uh, focus of Braxton's work. Um, so I'm a historian and I didn't know Dr. Braxton, so correct me <laughs> if anything uh, that I say is wrong. Um, but what really stood out to me in going through part of this collection is um, the fusion between the idea of um, being an engineer and having an engineering career, but also being someone who's very much involved in the community, involved in social justice, and kind of bringing together um, a unique and what I think is very significant marriage of engineering with social justice and civil rights. And in that way, I think Braxton is a really important example of how we can use engineering at places like Stevens to really work toward social justice issues, that social justice and civil rights do not have to be divorced from having a career and being an engineer. In fact, they can work together for the betterment of um, our communities and our nation. And this is what really begins to come through for me as a historian looking through this, co uh, this collection. Um, and I think that's a really important issue for us to, you know, kind of talk about and grapple with today as well. Um, and looking to these important examples and these exemplars and, you know, seeing how we can apply this um, today in our education of um, engineers and STEM education in general. So I'm just going to address kind of briefly two eras in um, the, the papers that sort of stood out to me in this regard. Um, so first, 
this moment when Roxton is at Atlanta University was like super exciting to me. When Leah told me about this, I was like, oh my goodness, that was an amazing time to be at, at Atlanta University because there was this real blossoming of intellectual um, and scholarly activity and artistic activity kind of meeting together in this unique moment. Um, so this is a uh, Romer Bearden piece and Bearden whom Braxton interacted with there, you know, is gonna go on to become a world renowned artist and um, W.E.B. Du Bois is there. And this is a really interesting time in his career because he's at the point in, in his career career when most people would be like considering retirement, <laughs> but Du Bois is actually becoming like more radical in his scholarship. Um, so he's arguably, you know, one of the most important minds of the 20th century. And at this time, um, he writes and he's just published a major study at the time when Braxton gets there, um, which was Black Reconstruction in America. And Du Bois is sort of grappling with um, the fallout from the publication of that book at the time when Braxton is there. So I can just imagine like the kind of conversations they were probably having um, over dinner at the faculty club. Um, and Du Bois argues in this book, and he's really the first historian to argue that African Americans are actually very active and engaged in the process of reconstruction, which amazingly was something that hadn't really been argued previously because um, mainstream U.S. history was so infused with racism and white supremacy. And Du Bois totally calls out that white supremacist foundation in the historical practice of the United States in this amazing last chapter of Black Reconstruction in America, which is called the Propaganda of History. And he talks about how um, you know, systemic racism has made the historical narrative of the United States so completely skewed, such as to leave out African-Americans and their involvement in the Civil War and Reconstruction. Uh, that article, I highly recommend it. I still teach with it all the time, and I still think there's no better critique of the way U.S. history is taught. And apparently, we're still fighting these battles today. I think we still really need those um, ideas today. Um, so Du Bois is kind of dealing with a lot of fallout at that time. Um, some people are just going to ignore his work. Some people are going to totally, um, you know, um, just make these vicious attacks on him because this is a very radical book to have just come out. Um, but he, he carries on and he also founds... Um, a really important journal at Atlanta University called Phylon during that time, which is still around today and still um, publishing cutting edge um, intellectual scholarship on um, you know, the black experience in the United States and across the diaspora. So this was a really interesting time for Braxton to be part of this sort of intellectual and social milieu. And um, I feel like, you know, this must have been sort of um, really contributing to, you know, what already seems to be his passion, which is, you know, sort of bringing together engineering with um, social justice as well. Um, so could I have the next slide? <clears throat> there we go. So I'm just going to fast forward to some really interesting things in the 1960s. Um, as Leah mentioned, Braxton is involved in um, the quest for equitable housing in the 1960s in Chicago. Um, and uh, he wrote a couple of really interesting um, sort of proposals. And in those, he, he notes, and I pulled out a quote here from October of 1960, says one of the most pressing problems facing the United States today is a disparity between the treatment of minority groups and the democratic ideals, which are part of its history. He goes on in this proposal um, to talk about how housing discrimination and jobs discrimination is, um, you know, for one, a major economic issue. And he really breaks down this idea of how 
things like white flight to the suburbs have sort of drained a lot of the big companies in the major cities from, you know, people who could have been part of, um, you know, these new jobs and part of management structures. And he says it's difficult for African Americans coming into the cities um, to get these jobs. And so he proposes like a, a complete restructuring where um, minorities from various backgrounds are brought into these major companies in order to begin the process of, um, you know, helping to foster new kinds of creativity, of helping to elevate um, you know, economic disparities in jobs and also helping to to sort of cross pollinate as well um, by bringing people together from disparate backgrounds. He argued that, um, you know, people will build relationships and create bridges. And he saw doing that as a way to really mend some of these deeply entrenched problems like systemic racism. And I thought that was just such a, um, it's a, it's a very well made argument and it's, um, it's a way to, you know, kind of look at housing and jobs disparity as, you know, kind of fundamental to these other issues such as segregation, right, which we usually think about, but we don't necessarily look at the job and, and housing side of things, which he seemed to have a real knack for. Um, and so he's really on the ground at the grassroots whenever Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference come into Chicago um, in the mid 1960s. And what King and his team tended to do was go to places where there was already sort of organic movements and processes happening um, and try to build on those and try to bring more national attention to those. And that's what happens in Chicago. And so Braxton is sort of part of this already grassroots movement that's happening. Um, and uh, unfortunately, what King in ends up bringing attention to is the just deeply held um, racism and hostility to issues like housing and jobs discrimination. And um, the, some of the marches are going to be attacked um, in Chicago. And, um, you know, by the time the, the movement moves to Chicago, the, this, you know, social movement that King is leading, um, it's, it's beginning to sort of fray and break down because now it's challenging these fundamental, seg you know, segregationist strictures that are happening all over the country, right? You can't just look at the South and say that's a Southern problem. Now, when you're looking at what's going on in Chicago, the same thing is being replicated across the country. And so um, now it can't really be ignored. And so people act out in hostility against it rather than actually dealing with the fundamental problems. But it was the fundamental problems that Braxton, you know, was already writing about and was really spending his career working on. And a lot of those problems were, of course, still grappling with today. Today, we still live in a largely segregated environment. And because we're not making those connections across racial and class lines, we're not forming those relationships in the way that Braxton suggested, right? We're still in this situation where we're deeply divided. And um, I just think it's fascinating that Braxton um, had, you know, such deep insight into these issues and was really using his career as an engineer um, to work on ameliorating those issues. So thank you so much <laughs> for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay Swindle. And thank you, Leah, for sharing this information. Hopefully our audience members can use a lot of the information to form their questions. Um, now we're going to have the discussion amongst our panelists. Um, and so the first question that I have is for uh, Mrs. Braxton and Emory Brown. Um, and the question is, how would Dr. Braxton want to be remembered? Well, I think he would want to be remembered as an engineer because to him, engineering was anything that involved problem solving, but he also viewed it as a vocation. And by that, I mean the way a doctor views medicine or a minister views uh, ministering and pastoring to people. 
it was a, com a profound commitment to use engineering for good, for constructive purposes that would help people and at a very basic level. And of, he had many attempts at starting a business, uh, but none, not one of them was ever trivial. I mean, in the 1950s, he tried to get a paper recycling plant going and then it was, nobody was thinking of it. Somebody was thinking about it, but it hadn't caught on yet. And, and that was another one of his ventures that didn't go. So, Emery? Yeah, so, so I think, um, you know, I think Michael James would obviously would, would have preferred to have been remembered as an engineer. Um, I think he would, he, he would have wanted to have been remembered as someone who inspired, uh, you know, youth, uh, in particular African-American youth to pursue um, engineering uh, in STEM fields uh, as a mechanism, not only for their own, uh, you know, career ambitions and, and, and survival, but just as, you know, as part of building an infrastructure, uh, you know, societal infrastructure uh, or a certain level of independence, right? Uh, with, within, uh, you know, within the African-American community and with, with, within communities of oppressed peoples um, across the board. You know, I think it's interesting, you know, we kind of talk about, you know, his interactions with Du Bois and, and, and when you think about Du Bois, you always think about the discussion between, or debates between, uh, you know, uh, Du Bois and Booker T. Washington, the philosophies. And, you know, when you think about, you know, the, 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 you know Booker T. Washington is often associated with trade and, uh, you know, Du Bois often think about, you know, you think about political action. And when you think about Uncle James, it's, it's really like an intersection, right? Of, of, to, to, to Tom Virginia's point, you know, the intersection of, you know, that vocational pragmatic approach to engineering as is almost like a trade, right? It's an elevated trade, it's a sophisticated trade, but he, he was able to successfully navigate that space where you can uh, go between, you know, a, a political activism, right? That kind of Du Boisian kind of mindset of, of, of you know, of an elevated approach, it, it, but, but also, you know, the foundational uh, a mechanism of just, you know, basic infrastructure, you know, focusing on, on, on building infrastructure, building housing, building, you know, different types of, of architectural elements uh, that are necessary to sustain, you know, for individuals to sustain, to, to create wealth, but also to build communities um, and, and a certain level of independence. So, so I think there's a beauty in his ability to kind of navigate, um, you know, almost like that double consciousness within a double consciousness that Du Bois always references. So, so I, you know, I think his legacy is really his engineer, who, who, who was able to leverage the, you know, technology and science back then to, um, you know, to, to, to really you know, help move the, the causes of his people and, and represent the oppressed. Thank you so much for your answers. Um, and so the next question I actually have is for Joelle. Um, how did you meet Dr. Braxton and what impression did he leave? So I had the pleasure of being introduced, you know, Virginia and I were, were reminiscing on, on that um, he was looking for team members as he was evolving with the Braxton system and someone had referred him or me to him. And I had the pleasure of meeting them when I was in Chicago uh, and Virginia. I still remember us having dinner and then taking a walk afterward and discussing the Braxton system. And he, it, his enthusiasm is just was infectious. Yeah. And I, I think the big opportunity here is that he's a trailblazer. And as technology evolves, you know, my significant other pointed out that with 3D printers, the Braxton system now is inevitable. This is, we, we, he started us off and now we have all these wonderful opportunities to truly bring his dreams to fruition. And so again, the, the wonderful STEP network, the wonderful Stevens network, that's how I, I met Dr. Braxton. And I encourage our alums to really stay connected, interconnected, because we, we have amazing skills and we should leverage it. And I, I, again, so happy that I met them and that the friendship continues through all these years. Thank you. Um, and so our next question is for uh, Josh and Kobe. Um, well, actually Josh, Kobe and Emery, 
Um, how is it? How important is it for Alphas to learn more about Dr. Braxton and his early induction to Alpha Phi Alpha? I'll take this one. I I would definitely say it's extremely important, and the reason I say that is because as Alphas, we learn to fit our community and to make sure that we, with whatever education or background we have, that we serve our community in the fullest capacity that we can, and. Dr. Braxton was able to do that to a level that you don't really see quite often. He was able to take his, he was able to take the teachings that we were all taught and actually put it into fruition. He took his engineering background and made affordable housing and made jobs for his community. He, no matter what place in life or no matter what location he was in, he always put his, his, his community first and he used, he leveraged his education and his background to make that possible. So I say it's extremely important because not only as alpha, but as black men and people who are in this field of STEM, this is the goal to be able to leverage our information, leverage our education and make the world a better place. And he was able to do that to the fullest extent. Um, just to backpack off that just a bit. Um, yeah, I would say it's like extremely important, but not just to alphas, but to like the black community and just to everybody in general, just to learn a bit about who James Braxton is. Um, I think Kobe hit the nail on the head in terms of like being able uh, as not like not only as alphas, but just as people in, in the United States, like you're able to make a difference. And um, James Braxton, since his uh, ambitions were so sky high and his love and passion for engineering has enabled for him to kind of make the, the necessary changes that he wanted to make and have a lasting impact. Um, I feel as though that's something that we could definitely teach, like not only ourselves, but those uh, in the future as well. Uh, for them to understand the importance of being able to follow your passions and the impact that you can have on your communities. Um, because I feel as though a lot of people uh, within the Black community, um, especially like young Black men and young Black women as well, um, they they tend to grow up in an environment where they don't like, they don't, they don't know of um, a lot of the adults that they kind of are surrounded or around or like they don't grow up in an environment where they have people like James Braxton that um, that are able to kind of achieve the things that he that he achieves. So being able to understand the history and um, understand the accomplishments, the accomplishments that James Braxton has been able to have, uh, not only in his community, but basically the entire engineering world is something that I would say is extremely important. Um, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I'd like to say to the young gentleman, um, teach your children black history, talk about it around the dinner table. When Jim and I went to the premiere of the opera Amistad, which was written about the Amistad uprising, and beforehand the, the composer spoke and he said that he had never heard of the Amistad until he was in college. But Jim grew up hearing about it at the dinner table. So the, the kind of education that you give your children and the young people around you, informal education, but this, this is there, it's important, that makes a difference. I, I was really struck by this brilliant young composer, but he had to go to college to learn Black history. Yeah, you know, the thing that I would, um, that I would contribute to, to the points made um, are, you know, one, you know, I think if, you know, for, for current members of uh, the fraternity, um, or any, you know, any fraternity, it's always important to understand your sense of purpose and to walk with purpose, right? Uh, and understand sacrifices that, you know, the, the people came before you made, right? So so for Alpha Phi Alpha in particular, uh, you know, Alpha Phi Alpha was founded on the campus of Cornell University in 1906 by seven black men, right? Who, who effectively, uh, think about it, right? I mean, students now uh, deal with, you know, feeling alienated uh, on, on, on campuses today. Um, and, and the population, might, a small population might be 
eight percent of a student student body. Imagine imagine in nineteen in the early nineteen hundreds, right? Um, it, what what you had to deal with, right? You had to consistently prove yourself, you know, uh, and and be uh, considered no matter what, be considered part of, uh, you know, be considered inferior. So so when I, you know, we look at at people in the fraternity, uh, the the, uh, the people who who really came came through in the earlier stages. There's a certain level of purpose, and, and it's anybody, right? Anyone, any any of our forefathers or ancestors who went to, you know, especially, uh, you know, desegregated institutions, um, you know, you have a certain purpose, and there are sacrifices that were made, and um, you know, you have to really appreciate the opportunity to uphold that legacy. These people did not go through the sacrifices that they went through for people to take, you know, for for the current generations, the sub, uh, subsequent generations, to take it lightly. So. So, you know, as far as, as, as Alpha Alpha goes, you know, I, I think it's important to understand that, you know, we have prominent members such as Martin Luther King, Thurgood Marshall, Jesse Owens, W.E.B. Du Bois, you know, uh, uh, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on. But, you know, just those are some of the prominent members. There are a number of, you know, more unsung people who are just excellent in where they conduct themselves and live their lives with the principles that you're taught uh, you know, Manly D scholarship and love for all mankind that transcends, uh, you know, uh, you know, after, uh, you know, our model is first of all, servants of all, we shall transcend all. And so, you know, I think those are the types of things that, you know, when you carry them with you, um, you know, and, and you live in that life, you, you definitely leave this earth making an impact well beyond your own, you know, your own benefit and your own, um, you know, accomplishments and the legacy that people can look at and say, that's a model that I want to follow, or that you know, no matter what time frame it is, I can follow. And the, and the last point I want to make is, you know, Virginia made a, a point about, you know, understanding history. And I think, you know, when I look at these parallels, right? You know, if you look today, it's probably what three percent of, of 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 engineers, practicing engineers, are, are black males, right? Um, you know, the wage gap, you know, no, no matter what, right? The wage gap for African Americans is probably what sixty five percent of that of a, of, a, of a white person. Uh, you know, uh, so similar profession. And if we don't understand the importance in, in the practices, right, uh, you know, in, in the history of, of policy and just, you know, uh, you know, some of these, these these laws and like, you know, you know, it just, just the, some of these, just, some of the, the tools that have been designed to oppress certain peoples and how they manifest themselves in today's society, then, then we don't have a shot at working to overcome them. And so you have to understand the history. You have to understand Jim Crow laws. You have to understand, you know, <laughs> the Atlanta Compromise, right? You understand what Du Bois fought for and what he struggled with, right? Um, and people like, you know, James Braxton, how they were able to navigate um, these spaces and, 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 and the focal, um, focal points of, of uplifting, um, you know, the African-American community. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was, that was great. Um, and I'm actually curious to know, uh, like, what what did Dr. Braxton Stevens' career look like? Um, being a black man or a black engineer, especially at Stevens, he's probably one of the only, if not the only, black person at Stevens at the time. And Kobe and Josh and myself, we can let you know, or and Joel can let you know, as Stevens students and alum, um, we go through different things, um, and we don't have to say that you know it's it's bad things. We we can take those and make it into like great lessons. Um, and so, you know, I was curious to know what did Dr. Braxton's, uh, Stevens' career look like? Well, you have to remember that he had a unique experience because his father was in this, his parents were in this church, which was, I used to tease him, he was born in a commune because they did live in a big, they, they bought a great big old resort hotel and they all had their meals together and then they had separate rooms, you know, for family stuff, but it was integrated. It was racially and, and, and throughout his life, he was that um, church continued. It was very small, it con but it continued to be racially integrated so that he um, was, was spared the necessity as a small child of always being a wary, of always being a, 
you know, he learned all that stuff. He went, he spent what, seven to eight years in the South. Um, but it, I think it gave him a freedom and a comfortableness if he were the only black person in the room. He, he, he was more comfortable with it than many Blacks would be. I'll put it that way. Because of this upbringing. And I picture him, I, I picture him running around as a toddler in the, in the dining hall in that hotel and everybody scooping him up and hugging him. And the joke, our joke is that I always picture him as a toddler being bald the way he was as a grown-up and and he was always saying see i had curls see i had curls in that picture but anyway i think it i think it made a a tremendous difference in his psyche okay um and then a question for everyone you know with everything that we've talked about this far i mean i do have more questions i don't think this is the last question um I think there's a lot of great value and lessons in a lot of his story and a lot of his interactions. Um, so for each of you, you know, what, what are some of the lessons that you can draw from his, his journey, um, just from like listening, from knowing him? Um, so anyone can start. I say perseverance. I have to say that, you know, I met Virginia and Jim in the 90s and he never gave up wanting to see the Braxton system come to fruition. And I remember getting an email message from him maybe five, six years later saying, okay, we've got another opportunity here. I'm talking to Sears. I don't know if you remember this, Virginia. And are you ready? Are you still on board? And so that enthusiasm to continue and belief in, in a process and a project, he, that is what I remember the most. I, I find that when I get distracted or I'm discontent with the situation, I just think about him he never gave up at all. And, and that I, I do appreciate and I'm, for that I'm grateful. I would say just from looking, from looking through his papers and really getting to know him, um, he's so inspiring. We also have eight hours of oral history recordings, which are amazing. He does talk about um, you know, his time at Stevens, just his career, personal interests. And that's like part of the value of having, um, you know, this type of archival collection where we can really delve deeper into someone's life and their experiences um, as they went through their career and did, you know, he did face discrimination and he, he wrote about it. Um, and it's, you know, it just provides so much, you know, um, context to the, the time period. And again, he's just, he's an ins inspiring person and so loving and caring. Um, such a, like, I've never met him. I didn't have the, um, you know, I, I wasn't able to meet him. Um, but I feel like I know him by going through his papers. And again, that's just part of the value of like, you know, why we need to have these type of, you know, archival collections that really delve deep into um, alumni's life like this. Um, like I would say is uh, always be ambitious, kind of like a little uh, quote there. Um, it's kind of like, you know, awe inspiring to me as well as like um, that I'm part of a fraternity that houses men such as James Braxton. Of course, there's like I'm okay. And of course, there's w, uh, WB Du Bois and such like that. But to have men of such like, uh, so to have a man of such distinction accomplish so much uh, within his lifetime um, living up to the age of 101, uh, which is uh, absolutely like astounding to, uh, to think about. Um, but like for him to like go through and read like just a quick summary um, that was kind of like provided to us in terms of like everything that he's accomplished, it always reinvigorates kind of like my own aspirations and my own ambitions and kind of what I want to accomplish within the world. Um, of course, like, uh, I'm only 21, so like, <laughs> just think, uh, uh, like uh, just, just think of all the things that I possibly can do, but um, just kind of reading about what James, uh, James Braxton has done um, is like definitely something that can inspire, like I, I feel like everybody, so. 
Now, I'll just add quickly, I was so excited to um, start to go through this collection um, when it arrived. And for me as an educator, it's really exciting to be able to share this story, you know, when I teach about, um, you know, the history of Stevens, um, which Leah and I are going to be teaching this summer, um, and the history um, in the local area, you know, to have someone, you know, who's really grounded in this area and who is so inspiring, you know, I really enjoy uh, sharing that story and being able to, you know, to sh show um, how, um, you know, people can come from here and go on to do such great things. So as an educator, this is, you know, just uh, like a godsend. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one, the one the, you know, I think a couple things jump out to me, um, you know, just, just from a theoretical perspective, you know, the, when you think about his life, you know, I think of that whole quote, you know, discipline is the bridge between thought and accomplishment. And when you're an engineer, you know, I think part of it is a certain level of discipline, you know, following, you know, schematics and, and understanding, um, you know, plans and, and just, and, and, and we think about life, you know, and, and the complexities of life, you know, life is a cumulative effort where you build things brick by brick, stick by stick, block by block, right? And and, and he kind of did both of those things, right? And, and this man lived 101 years, right? Um, and, and we're not even, we haven't even talked about that, all right? The fact that this person was born probably 20 years after, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, you know, 23 years before, 23 or 25 years before, uh, you, you know, before some of the legislation that, that kind of out started to, to break up probably 30 years before, you know, we started to see uh, movement and, and desegregation and right in the middle of Jim Crow. Um, and so, you know, you, you, you have the weight of that life is the weight of, of societal, uh, you know, mechanism to oppress black men is just as, you know, was, was probably arguably worse than what we see today it may it may it may, may, may this be manifest in a different way and so we think of someone living for 101 years so they're born 20 years after Plessy versus Ferguson right and 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 and, and died during the you know Obama year or died I think during Obama years right <laughs> like we, it's, it's we a, voted for weeks yeah yeah, yeah. And, and, and 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 spent and spent critical times in, in in the in the area where Obama basically got his footprint, I mean that that is like your ancestors' wildest dreams manifested, if nothing yeah. else. Jim right? Jim was the older generation to Obama's, yes. but yes. Jim's son Wayne went to the the Hyde Park where they lived was was sort of like the black elite or <laughs> active part in Chicago and. Um, when the, then we were living on the north side and um, they redistricted and we went and uh, Obama ran for state legislature and we went to a meet and greet and met him and voted for him ever since, every time he ran mm -hmm. for anything. <laughs> the only time we didn't vote for him was when he ran against Bobby Rush but Bobby Rush has never forgiven them for that, I think. But anyway, they were, the districts were changed. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, one thing I'll say about his life, you know, there's, there's a, a line in the poem, If by Roger Kipling, which says, if you can uh, fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds, or if a distance run, yours is the world and everything that's in it, which is more you'll be a man, my son. And, I, and, and, and a number of people learn that, learn that poem throughout the years. Um, over the years uh, in, in different capacities. But when you think about his life, I mean, he filled every, you know, uh, every second of that minute, you know? Um, and, and, and so, I mean, to me, that, that, that's just a tremendous legacy that, that, you, that, that you don't see those lives. You don't, you don't see those lives uh, very often. Um, I also want to take a stab at this question because, um, for me, like, you know, listen to everything. Uh, there's a few things that stands out to me, but the, the first thing that really does stand out is the way that Dr. Braxton uses, um, you know, his career to also be an activist. I think that lesson can carry on for not just engineers, because for me, I'm not an engineer, I'm an artist. 
So, mm-hmm. you know, using the design and, um, you know, advocating for my communities has been extremely important for me, even at Stevens. Um, and I think that that lesson should be echoed a lot at Stevens because um, there are social justice issues and um, there are attempts for of social justice uh, organ- based organizations to, uh, you know, put on a fight, but there aren't as many people who will participate. Um, and so that kind of leads to my next question and uh, um, asking, you know, why is it important for uh, the Stevens community to learn about Dr. Braxton? And that can also be for everyone. It, I would say actually the Stevens community or uh, the Black Stevens community. It's our legacy. I mean, he is, and not only is he our legacy as in someone who was a trailblazer and, and set some, and set standards, but he gave back. He constantly gave back to the Stevens Technical Enrichment Program from which many of us benefited. I know I yeah. absolutely benefited from the STEP program. And to have these alum come back and tell us their experiences out there, opportunities that are available that we may not, about which we may not know, things to avoid. This, they are our, they're our leaders. And, and it's very important for us to understand where, we're, where we end up. Um, and I encourage, again, all of our, our alums you know, black women, just all of us to constantly give back to our, you know, the, the, our successors, because we have valuable, invaluable lessons that Dr. Braxton absolutely knew that we can provide to the next generation. Um, and so I, I believe that if, if, you know, he did a great job of making sure that he did not forget from where he came and constantly, um, constantly fed back into that. Anyone else want to answer that question? I'd say it's definitely important for the Stevens community and more importantly, the Black community in Stevens to know about him and recognize him because he's such, like uh, Ms. Joel said it herself, he's our legacy. And more importantly, he's a part of our community. He came from Stevens. He himself is a man of color. If we don't pay attention and shine men like this, then what, uh, what honesty is the point of Black History Month? Who, who are we celebrating? It's not enough to just celebrate the names we know. It's more important to go back to find the names that may have passed through the slips of time and actually give them the recognition they deserve. Because I'll be honest, be honest and say, Dr. Braxton deserves this recognition. Um, with his work with the Braxton systems alone, he deserves his recognition. And for me, it's just, it's empowering to see a man of his statue because in times at Stevens, you don't really know if you're going to make it. You don't really know if you're going to finish that degree. You don't really have the drive to finish that degree at times. And being able to know that there's not only a man that made it, but a man that made it in more stressful times than you, how can you not feel empowered? How can you not feel the drive to actually go out there and do the same things that he accomplished, if not greater? Because that's the goal, to be able to leave a greater mark than our ancestors did. And honestly, after reading and learning about Dr. Braxton, I I feel as though I could take on the world because if he can do it, why can I? If he can get his degree and make such a powerful change in this world, why can't the rest of us? I'm actually so glad you mentioned that because, um, so one of the ideas that uh, uh, Dr. Swindle and I had discussed was creating, because from all of this, you, cre- you we get so many valuable lessons. And for me, when I've heard about, like when I hear about um, black alum, I, it's associated with an, a success story. We can even look at Joel's story. Um, and I think, you know, learning about those stories is, is clearly inspirational to our community, um, especially now today, as someone who recently graduated and Josh and Kobe, you both know that, you know, as much, you know, getting as much help and, you know, empowerment as, as you know, as we can is extremely helpful to assuring that the inclusivity or inclusion of uh, the Black community at Stevens right now. Um, and so the idea that Dr. Swindle and I had was creating a either a Black Studies, Black Minor, or Black Humanities, um, somewhere along those lines, so that you know other Stevens students, um, including the you know, Black students, can learn about you know you know from for an example, Dr. Braxton. There's so many lessons here, so this definitely I feel is doable. Um, so I guess you know what do you guys think that's a good idea? Like what are your I guess you know first thoughts on that idea? Um, it's funny because I remember, I feel like we had this discussion before in the past the one. Yeah, we did, we did, we did. <laughs> having, having that at Stevens and everything. And I, um, 
full support of it, honestly. If there's any way I can help, please let me know <laughs> of actually having that uh, at Stevens because I feel as though being able to provide like this type of history, not just like in a panel or like a day type of thing, but actually through a whole like either a few years or uh, several classes of because I feel there's so much about like black history that you could go into in regards to Stevens um, that I feel as though that this kind of I feel like this should have happened already, but that's just me. Um, because I feel because we already have like uh, um, what what's about it? We already have like mandatory writing to do within the um, engineering. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Through like the uh, engineering uh, engin engineering curriculum, we have to take two mandatory writing classes and everything like that. But uh, and they go over like different histories uh, depending on the teacher, whether it's uh, food um, or uh, just the basic history and everything. But having a specific class or a specific few classes or a minor for example that goes directly towards black history is definitely something i feel could not only be um like game changing in terms of like the future students but could also um empower a lot of the students um a lot of the black community as students as well and that empowerment part is the biggest part i think that's perfectly phrased uh would anyone else i'd like to add to that Well, I'll just I'll throw in real quick um, that this is, you know, this is how things get started, right? You know, we have these conversations, we talk about them, and, you know, we move forward. So it's it's exciting to, you know, be at the space where we're talking about them. But go ahead, Kobe. It's something that I definitely would be interested in taking. Like, I wish, <laughs> I hope it gets started before I graduate. But, um, yeah, this, it's, it's, it's needed in essence, in short, in a concise way, it's needed. Um, we don't, as as a part of the black community, I can honestly say that we aren't taught our history um, in public schools as well as we should. And we aren't really taught it as well as we should in other forms of education. So to be able to offer that as a minor um, and to be able to offer it at the highest level, the collegiate level, and to be able to actually delve into it and teach us the history and importance of it, um, it goes a long way for our community because it's not only empowering, but it's enriching. We lose our sense of culture, we lose our sense of selves if we're not actually going back and learning about ourselves. What's, our history carries weight, and unless we actually learn about it, we won't really know what that weight is. It's true. Um, and so I think we can now start answering questions from our audience because I was looking at the questions from our list and the audience, and they, they kind of overlap. So. Um, I will read, um, I will choose a question. Actually, I'll just go from the top. Let's see. Does the question show up? No, okay, I'll just read it. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, did you, do you want me to read it to you or did you say Yeah, yes, please. Okay. <laughs> um, how were Doc, Dr. Brock, Dr. Braxton's career ambitions and journey influenced by his travels, did his passion for affordable housing guide him to Atlanta and around the world, or did his career passion guide him to these places? Both interested to learn how I can apply similar strategies to inform my own career journey. Jim didn't travel for pleasure until he met me, and then I insisted on a few vacations. <laughs> He would, he would go someplace for an engineering project and he would be very observant wherever he went. But he, his, his background didn't, there, there weren't many vacations, I think, in his background. They did have a little um, summer cabin in Nyack, the church did, and, and they could go up there, but they, not for very long and vacations he, he loved his work so much he didn't think about much about vocation a vacation mm -hmm. but he he did um I, I lost the thread of it i'm sorry go ahead um we can go on to the next question um what fueled dr braxton's resilience to continue um, his expand and expand his craft and to express his ingenuity while operating in a space where he was likely the only or very few black men. I, 
I think his religious faith had, and religious upbringing had a lot to do with his resiliency, although he didn't didn't make a big show about it. But I think it was fundamental to him. And um, he he was a person that people liked working for, which is not always the case when you have a boss who's black and subordinates who are white. But he was so good with people. He was, he was such a warm and open person that, and the fact that he was a very good engineer all came together so that people liked working for him. And sometimes they would be promoted out of his department and say, oh, I wish I could come back <laughs> because the new place wasn't nearly as uh, pleasant as, as Jim's department. Great. Um, the next question for all panelists, what suggestions do you have for current Stevens students who want to make a positive impact on social justice issues with their STEM degree, but don't know where to start? It's a great question. So I, I think um, I'll take a quick stab at this. My degree was in, uh, in engineering management and I do not discount absolutely getting a foundation first in what you were trained. Um, and so I started off my career focused on engineering in the sense of technology implementation uh, in, in that sense. So I utilized my degree and from that came other opportunities. I started a company um, and then I am where I am now, which is fueled more by passion. But still I utilize my engineering skills. Still I utilize my analytical skills. And I, I think you allow your degree to establish that foundation. And from there, from that, I wouldn't say that comfort, but at least where you, where you are, where you are doing something you know, you can look around you and see the opportunities where you can apply it to make a difference, to impact areas that may not seem so obvious to the engineer in general. Um, and so that's what I encourage you as a student is to utilize what you're learning. Don't discount where, you know, where it takes you, it, you know, as a, as a the start, but then look around you and see where you can apply the skills that you have, because you'd be amazed. I, I was telling everyone earlier, my fellow panelists, the fact that you say that you're an engineer just opens up doors. People, it, it immediately validates you no matter what it is. And how freeing is that? How empowering is that? Um, and so we've got lots of opportunities out there. You know, start where you are and just look around. It'll, I'm telling you, it'll appear Whatever the opportunity is, it will appear for you. And I'd like once to said, that. ideas walk among us and accost us. In other words, you, you're sitting there walking around and the idea comes up and hits you and respond to it, respond to it. And I'll just add real quickly um, to reiterate something that Dr. Dr. Braxton wrote in one of his um, proposals in the 1960s. 60s is, you know, once, um, you know, lots of different people from different backgrounds, you know, are working together, um, you know, form those relationships. And, you know, the more you get to know people across racial lines and class lines, and I mean, it sounds like something simple, but I think it's really the way to begin to connect people. I mean, that's how we get to what Dr. King called the beloved community, right? When we get to know each other, when we live close to each other, when we work together and we begin to care about each other and have those relationships, right? And that's something that we, we don't always have right now, right? And you know, anywhere we can foster you know, bringing people together as opposed to division, I think um, can be really powerful. Um, I could I could take a step at this as well. Um, um, I'm not. I guess I don't fall within STEM, but I'm going to say STEAM arts. Um, <laughs> so the suggestion that I have for current students who want to make a positive impact on social justice issues um, is first by just utilizing like who you know already, your colleagues, your your peers, um, and you know making them aware of you know issues that you find uh, interesting or you want to uh, bring to light. Um, in doing so, you know, creating your own, like, you know, I guess, passion projects, I would call it. So that was, for me, I created uh, my own, like, I guess, 
well, it's a magazine. <laughs> it's called Black Masculinity, and it really just uh, uh, starts a discussion around uh, Black men's mental health and masculinity. Um, and so I use my skills from, you know, my degree, you know, the arts that I've learned and the marketing um, and for my internships and use, utilizing that to, you know, make uh, content for not just social media, but for a digital publication and an online exhibition. Um, so I think there's, you can definitely use for sure the skills that you've learned um, and don't be discouraged if there aren't anything out there, if there isn't anything out there um, that you might want to do yet, because you can be the first one. Um, while it might be scary to do it, just take your time and get it done because the power lies within you. And we need a lot of that in the world today. So that's my two cents on that. Um, I would also say it starts from an understanding of the community and the problems that it suffers. You don't necessarily want to start out um, thinking of just using your STEM degree to make change without knowing what change you need to make. Uh, Dr. Braxton recognized the lack of on the lack of employment in Chicago as well as the lack of housing there and he was able to leverage his degree because he's, as a civil engineer that's essentially what you focus on so he was able to create a system in which he tackled both of those problems so before you think about leveraging your degree make sure you understand what problems you're actually trying to face and what problems that community faces so that you can then either use your degree or use your resources and networks to um make about the proper change yeah, I echo what, your, what Kobe just said. You know, my degree started me off at where I'm working now in technology implementation. And I went through a divorce, um, saw how other women, very smart women, other engineers, just were not financially confident. And that transitioned me from utilizing my engineering skills on the technology side to utilizing it on the financial side for the, this, you know, again, we have the skill sets for analyzing situations and applying. And so now that is where my passion lies, is empowering women. You, you would, I would not have known that in the beginning of my, you know, graduating from Stevens. That, that would not even have been apparent to me without having the life experiences. And as Kobe mentioned, no, looking around and seeing what the social issues are that we can solve. Um, so I, I agree. I agree. I know um, we're getting a little bit past time, so we have a few other questions. There was one question in um, the chat box about a Wikipedia page for James Braxton. I think that's a great idea. We don't have one, we should create one. So um, to kind of disseminate more of his life and um, impact. And then there was another question about, um, let me see. Comment, um, this, this information is valuable and inspiring. What are some ways Stevens can assist in circulating it to the masses? Well, exactly what we're doing now. I mean, yeah. this, I, I, I know that there's been you know, a lot of complaints about the effects of COVID, but to be totally honest, I am so grateful for a way to interact with my you know, fellow alums easily. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I moved to Texas and felt so disjointed from my Stevens community being out here. And this has been such a wonderful way to interact and stay, you know, stay in the know. I even joined the book club, the Stevens book club. How wonderful is that? Oh, does so Stevens have I, a book club? They do. Talking to strangers right now, we're, do, we're doing that book. Uh, send, so, me, send me the reference. <laughs> oh, I will do that. But I, 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 we keep doing these things. This has been, this is such a wonderful way for us to stay connected, communicate, disseminate information. Um, I, I've been just astounded and, and pleased with Stevens, especially. Amazing. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and Leah's article, Leah's written an article for the alumni magazine, The Indicator. So look for Leah's article too. <laughs> oh yeah, Josh was, had something, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna add something real quick because uh, I actually have class in like three minutes, but um, I, I just wanted to say uh, uh, the best way to kind of like share information so, such as this is just to talk about it and just to share it with everybody else. So say if you're here uh, uh, in this webinar, then of course you can tell a friend and that friend can tell another friend. And that'll be kind of the easiest way that you'll be able to kind of share not only James Braxton history, but black history in general. 
Um, but yeah, that's basically the final things I have to say. I'm, I'm going to have to go off now. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I just want to say uh, thank you to um, uh, Professor Schwendel, of course, for inviting me uh, to be a panelist here. And it was great uh, meeting you all uh, once again. So thank you. <laughs> we enjoyed it too. Thanks, Dr. <laughs> Um, I think for me, uh, some ways that students can help in circulating it is, I think Josh, I think, you know, having that way of uh, just communicating it, talking about it with other students uh, members, because we can make social media posts. Um, but I think really talking about it will do a lot more uh, justice. Um, and yeah, that's it. Well, I'm looking forward to being able to, to share this panel with any number of people, including <clears throat> we had a friend, or I had a friend, I don't think he ever met Jim in, in person, who when I was breaking up our house, before our home before I moved to California, uh, he was an instructor with a um, youth conversation core, I think and a fine teacher. And he took Jim's tools and used Jim as an example of, of things that could be achieved because his students were all Blacks. And um, I'm looking forward to forwarding the link to this to him. So. Great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And thank you for everyone for participating in the panel. I think we're, we're a bit over time. Um, but so if anyone has any final thoughts or anything, we are recording this. So it will be on um, our website and available. Um, but I think it's great. And I think we should definitely have more discussions like this in the near future. Yeah. Well, count me in. I'd love to, uh, again, participate more. Thank you. <laughs> great. <laughs> And thanks to Dewan for moderating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank you for both thank for you. reaching out to me to moderate. Thank you. <laughs> and also I loved like you know meeting everyone else. Um, especially Joel. It's, it's gonna be great having you as a as part of my network because Stevens, uh, the black community at least does a lot or is doing a lot. Um, and you know, having that uh, connection is important. So and I know we're gonna connect on LinkedIn. So all those alum who are on here, my name is Joelle Hines. I expect a LinkedIn connection request. <laughs> I'm easier to find than most people. So we have to stay connected, leverage, <laughs> network. Yeah. All right, um, thank you everyone and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Good night. Bye. Good night.